Well, good morning. My name is John Allen. I am the pastor here at Risen Church, and it is good to see everybody here. Uh, apparently, I'm like, there's like three people that are uh, okay with that. Like, you're excited to be here. Are you, are you excited to be here? All right. I, I am too. I am very, very happy to be here. I want to reiterate, if you are uh, a first-time guest with us, we do have a gift for you. It's just going to be online. It's just digital. Part of the uh, restrictions for the COVID-19 gathering situation that we're in is that we can't pass out anything officially to you, and therefore, we will do it digitally. Cool? So, um, it actually is a little bit more efficient, so whatever. Um, so again, also, we have a Connect card for you to fill out online. We would love for you to do that. That's how we'll get you connected. Um, if you are joining with us online, that goes for you too. And so, we are almost halfway through 2020. Some of you are like, yay. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah. I don't know whether it's gone fast or gone really long, right? It's been a crazy year. A lot has happened in our country, in our world, in just a few months, right? I think it would be an understatement to say that our land is in need of significant healing, right? We're in need of so much healing that it's actually probably pretty easy to look at our situation, everything that's going on, and get kind of cynical even. Maybe even cynical about the possibility that healing is even a thing. Do you think that this land can be healed? It's easy to kind of detach and think, well, you know, the Bible does talk about things getting worse. The Bible does talk about trouble and tribulation and trial. Heating up, ramping up, so maybe this is just it. So just buckle up and settle in, right? Yesterday, I don't know if you knew this, but yesterday was the 76th anniversary of D-Day. When Americans and Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy and fought their way to victory over fascism and just wickedness, just audacious injustice. That was yesterday. 76 years ago, that happened. It was a moment in time where the brokenness of this world was on display. But so was the humility and self-sacrifice that was necessary to bring healing to the land. So we are experiencing a lot of brokenness in the world right now. But I want to share something that I came across recently that brought a little perspective and hope. So I'm going to share this uh, as we dive into the message this morning. So I want you to do something for me. Imagine that you were born here in America in the year 1900. By the time you're 14 years old, World War I would start and it would end on your 18th birthday. 22 million people would be killed in that war. Later that same year, the Spanish flu would hit and it would last until you were 20 years old. 50 million people would die from Spanish flu just in those two years. When you're 29, the Great Depression would begin. Unemployment hits 25%, global GDP drops 27%, and that lasts until you're 33. America, along with the world economy, almost com collapses completely. But just as things are feeling a bit more stable, when you turn 39, World War II starts. When you're 41, the U.S. is fully engaged in the war, and between your 39th and 45th birthday, 75 million people die in the war. The Holocaust kills 6 million. These are conservative estimates. When you're 52, the Korean War starts and 5 million people are killed. When you're 54, the American Civil Rights Movement begins and the United States gets turned upside down. That lasts until you're 68 years old. Some would say it's still going. When you're 62, the Cold War hits, the Cuban Missile Crisis happens, and nuclear war is halted simply through a few temperaments that could have gone a totally different direction and devastated the entire world. 
By the time you're 64, Vietnam begins. And that lasts until you're 75 years old and four million people are killed. All in one lifetime. What we face as a nation today is difficult. There's no question. The brokenness is real. We're going to talk about that this morning. We need healing. We need healing. But the words of Jesus ring as true as they ever have. John 16, says this, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world, you will face trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. That wasn't just for that time. That wasn't just for that time period. It's for this time period. Expect it. Know it's going to happen. Trouble, trial, tribulation, brokenness. The world is flipped upside down. Darkness is here. Jesus says, take heart. You can find peace in me. A lot of people sort of take an attitude of just kind of throwing up their hands, like, you know, put on your mask, you know, feel like there's nothing you can really do anyway. Detach, right? It's easy to believe that you're just kind of a bystander when things like this happen. It's easy to think that it's all just sort of up to the government to fix things, to take care of things. It's all on their shoulders, you know? Maybe I'll write my congressman or something. Or, or vote. That's the answer. I'll just vote. That's all I can do is vote, right? Wrong. Don't misunderstand me. Voting is great. Praise God for legitimate, untampered with voting, right? That may be the answer. That may be an answer. But it's not the answer. It's not. Don't be deceived. The brokenness of this world is not healed by a politician. It never has been. It cannot be fixed through legislation. It ain't going to work. Like, praise God for legislation. Leg legislation. Legislation, right? Praise God for it. But at the end of the day, it's all just a band-aid over the bullet wound of sin. You cannot legislate an end to racism. You cannot legislate an end to corruption. You cannot legislate an end to greed or fear or manipulation. These are heart issues. The government is not the ultimate solution. So what is? Can our land be healed? And if it can, how? Anybody remember the scripture God gave us as a church at the beginning of uh, 2020? Come on, you guys haven't memorized every sermon I've preached? <laughs> Look, if I've learned anything during my time as a pastor, it's that I'm not the head of this church. Jesus is. That may surprise some of you. I hope it doesn't surprise anybody. Jesus leads us. His spirit rules and reigns in our midst. He is our leader. He is our guide. And the passage that we kicked off 2020 with was in a series called 2020 Vision. And we launched out of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which says this. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. slightly relevant for 2020. Don't you think? This morning, I want to rewind and refocus on the vision that Jesus gave us as his people for 2020. I want to ask this question, can there be healing for our land? Or are we just destined for this division and destruction? Look, there's no room for doubt here. When you look at this passage, healing is available. It's there but there is a condition attached to it. The passage starts off with if. If Americans will elect the right president, then I'll hear their land. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that. If the media will start actually telling the truth and set their weird agendas aside, then I'll hear their land. Is that what it says? Mm -mm. It doesn't say that. 
How about if the Supreme Court would just, or, or, or what about the, if the police would only, well, what if rioters would stop? Nope. How about if Democrats would, or, or the Republicans, or, or what if Democrats and Republicans, well, what if, if black people would only, or what, white people, what if, no. Doesn't say any of that. If non-Christians would just turn to God, then, now that one actually feels a little bit legitimate, doesn't it? Right? Lost suddenly get saved, turn to Jesus, everything turns around. That's not what it says. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people, say my people, who are called by my name, say called by my name, who are God's people? Who are God's people who are called by his name? Well, let's back up, okay? Remember, context matters in scripture. Because this is an Old Testament passage, right? Like, this is an Old Testament. Who's he talking about? Israel. He's not necessarily talking about us, right? This setting was thousands of years before Jesus and the church even began. This is a promise to Solomon, King Solomon, the son of King David, just after they consecrated the temple or dedicated and built the temple of God. They consecrated it, set it apart, and they're dedicating it. And God warns King Solomon, the son of David, that if they lose sight of who God is as a people and they start running to their own ways again, then all kinds of bad things are going to break out and happen in their land. But he also then gives this son of David a promise that no matter how bad things get, if his people who are called by his name humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So he's clearly talking about God's people in the Old Testament, the people of Israel. People who are being led by a wise king, a son of David. There is a powerful prophetic picture here of Jesus and the church, but the historical setting is really important for us to get and understand. God's giving his people a powerful opportunity here and an enormous responsibility. So let's look at the next couple of verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 15 now. Look at 15. So stay with me here because this is really important for you guys to capture. All right? If, you, if you're not used to following biblical stuff, if you're like, oh, you're in the Old Testament, I don't really understand all this stuff, lean in, pay attention. You might need to put some big boy pants on, but it's all right. You got a brain God blessed you with. It's beautiful. Let's go. Okay? You with me? Here we go. Verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. So what place is he talking about? The temple. The temple that the son of David has just dedicated before the people of God who are called by his name. This is the meeting place with God and his people. This is the point at which heaven meets earth. Verse 16. For now I have chosen and consecrated or set aside this house that, may, that my name may be there forever. Say Forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. He says it again because he's trying to repeat something. It's significant because it matters. So God said his eyes will be open and his ears attentive to the prayers made in the temple that was built by the son of David. Again, remember that the son of David is a title that Jesus Christ received and operated under thousands of years after this. He said that house is set aside as holy and his name would dwell there forever, that his eyes and his heart would be there for all time. But then that temple was destroyed. This is just history. First, the Babylonians destroyed it and then it was rebuilt, but it was rebuilt as a shadow of what it once was. Then it was destroyed again about 700 years later by the Romans. And only about 30 years before the Romans crushed it, Jesus, the son of David, comes, points out that the temple 
He points to the temple, and then only a few days before he's crucified, he says that this temple would be destroyed, but that he would raise it up again in three days. Follow me. About 36 years after Jesus said that, that's exactly what happened. In 70 AD, the Roman general Titus rolls into Jerusalem, and he tears the temple down brick by brick. General Titus, he kind of, he, he rolls in, he's even mockingly strolls into the inner court of the temple, right into the Holy of Holies, where uh, he pulls back the curtain, goes into the place where God's presence was supposed to dwell, and where, you know, if you go into that area, you were supposed to be struck down dead into this spot. And he goes in and nothing happens, and he just kind of mocks and says, this, is whole, this whole thing is silly. Why? Why did nothing happen? Because about 36 years before, King Jesus comes in and declares that the temple was corrupt and cursed. He cursed it. He cursed the fig tree for not producing fruit, and then the next day it withers. Fig trees represent prayer and the dwelling of God's covering over his his people. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It was a picture of the temple. And then after he does this, the, the, the fig trees were pictures of coverings of God's people where God would sit under them in his presence and they would pray just like the temple was designed to be. And right after he curses the fig tree, he walks into the temple and he starts turning tables over and calling people out for turning his father's house that was designed to be a place of prayer into a den of thieves. You guys remember this story? Just a few days later, if you haven't, that's what happened. If you don't know that story, that happened. Just a few days later, he's crucified on our behalf as the ultimate sacrificial lamb who died for the sins of all who placed their faith and hope in him. And when he was crucified, when he dies, it says that this three foot thick curtain that was separated, that separated humanity from the Holy of Holies, the presence of God Almighty, was split in half from top to bottom when Jesus died. So when Titus shows up in 70 AD, when he destroyed, what he destroyed was no longer the true temple of the Lord upon the earth. Remember Jesus said, I'll raise the temple back up in three days. So when he was crucified, the temple was officially destroyed. The curtain split. Without the presence of God, the temple was nothing but bricks. It had the appearance of godliness, but it had denied its power, which comes through his presence. After three days, Jesus is resurrected. He's raised from the dead. See, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. This is the gospel message. God became a man. He lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserved to die, and he conquered death in the grave and paved the way to eternal life that starts now, not just one day when we die, but starts now because his Holy Spirit is made available to do what? Dwell within you. You know what that means? The temple was resurrected as his people. Whomever would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the church of Jesus Christ. It's not a building. It's a people filled with his spirit, his presence that goes with us and indwells within us, a people called by his name, a people submitted to one king, Jesus Christ, the son of David, a people filled with his spirit, a chosen race, a holy nation, the royal priesthood of all believers. This is what we just sang about. Right? And the church of Christ was born, then the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name and his freedom, I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Look, the, the book of Ephesians talks about each individual person being living stones that sort of house the presence of God like a temple upon the earth. That's why where two or three are gathered in his name, his presence is with you. This is the power of the local church upon the earth. You are the temple of God. All right, you got it? You got it? You know what that means? All of that to say, that means you are the place where heaven meets earth. You are the carriers of his presence. You are the agents of his redemptive work upon this earth. You are the ministers of reconciliation. 
It's not the government's job. It's yours. The government does not have the power to change hearts. All they can do is legislate and enforce laws. You are the carriers of the presence and the promise and the power of Jesus Christ, who is the hope of the world. You are. I don't care who's in office. If the church is operating as the church is to operate, God's kingdom advances. It's a proven fact throughout history that wherever the true gospel message takes root, the land receives healing. So who are God's people called by God's name in this land? You. It's not me. It's not my job. It's not just the pastors, the professional Christians. So weird. You are the church of Jesus Christ, the chosen race, the holy nation, the royal priesthood, the sons and daughters of the most high king, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the ministers of reconciliation, the ambassadors of Christ. You are conduits of his grace and presence upon the earth, his hands, his feet, his embrace, the expression of his face, the sound of his voice to the hurting and broken. He has chosen you, set you apart, empowered and commissioned you to bring healing and reconciliation to this world in every situation. To take this message of grace to all people, it's not up to the government, it's up to you. His eyes are upon those, his eyes are upon you, his ears are attentive to you. He has chosen and consecrated you that his name and his eyes and his heart will be with you forever. And this means he's paying attention. He's not primarily paying attention to the government or the media or the CDC or the NAACP. He's paying attention to his people who are called by his name, no matter what media outlet they pay attention to. He's on the edge of his throne, ready to unleash heavenly healing, but there is something he's waiting for. There is something he's looking for and he's listening for. Three things, just three, so simple, three. And these are my three points, and I'm going to be done. First thing, humble yourself. Second thing, pray and seek God's face. Third thing, turn from your wicked ways. What's this? I'm not just another opinion. I'm tired of opinions. This is what the word of God says. He's not asking all of America to do this. Very important. He's only asking his church to do this. So what does this look like? Humble yourself. Entertain the possibility that you might be wrong in the way you're thinking about things. Just because it seems right to you doesn't mean it's right. Proverbs 21, 2, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. I've heard a lot of passionate rhetoric lately. Some of it sounds good, but it's absolutely ungodly. This is why God's constantly calling us to die to ourselves every day to submit ourselves to his ways and realize that his ways are higher than our ways as the heavens are above the world, as his heaven, as the heavens are above the earth. So are his ways above our ways, according to Isaiah 55. So it honestly doesn't matter how you feel about it. Humility is Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 8. It's trusting in the Lord with all your heart and not leaning on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledging him and he will make your straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Again, I'm sick of the opinions of people, man. If it's not rooted in the gospel, it's just baseless and hollow nonsense. It's just empty rhetoric. It only breeds arrogance and division constantly. Humility stands upon the word of God, whether it lines up with your initial opinions or not. We set them aside and we seek the king. Humility isn't weakness. It's meekness. This is what it means to be God's people who are called by his name. Because there's a huge difference between weakness and meekness, right? 
To be meek is like being bridled. Like when you bridle a horse, imagine a, a powerful stallion that's just bursting with strength, just wide open. If you've ever been around a horse, I, I once had the opportunity to work with a high-spirited, very high-spirited stallion um, named Titus. No, no relation to the general I just was talking about. But this, this stallion, which the difference between a stallion and a regular horse is that, the, you know, the, the stallion can still make baby horses, right? He's still got his giddy up, which means that he's filled with a lot of testosterone, and they can be very difficult to handle. They can be, they can be hard to sort of like rein in, so to speak. And so this horse, he, the stallion was beautiful, man. He, 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 had, he was black. He was a black and white paint. He had these gorgeous blue eyes, um, and he was just pure muscle, very intimidating. Whenever he was let out of the pasture, if you've ever seen a horse do this, he, he just bolts, just takes off. And it's just this impressive show of strength. Um, he would leap up in the air, and he'd kick, and he'd roll around in the grass. And he, he, it was just amazing. It was like he would float and then he'd get up and just run in every direction as fast as he could. Just unbelievable. I loved watching it. But when you bridle him, when you put a bridle on him, when all of that power and strength gets meeked and placed into the hands of a good rider, all that power gets centralized into purpose. Holding the reins of Titus was like harnessing the sun in one little hand. And all that strength gets aligned and controlled and he's meeked and with a good rider, he was stronger than ever. To drive home this illustration, that particular horse, Titus, actually twisted a gut while rolling around and acting berserk one day and he died from it. His unbridled nature is actually what ended up killing him. Humility says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God because he cares for you. Trust in him. Humility says, along with King David in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Humility is required to be the living sacrifice in Romans 12.1, it, 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 which speaks of, it, it means it's necessary to no longer conform to the pattern of this world. Humility is necessary to no longer conform to the pattern of this world. So you're able to be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You can't do any of this without humility. Without humility, you're left to your own opinions, your own deceptions. You're left to fend for yourself against a spiritual enemy who's pulling all the strings of your ego and leaving you just like a puppet in this world. Without humility, you are the problem. Without humility, violence only begets more violence. Without humility, you won't seek to learn and listen and understand. You'll only assert yourselves in moments when God is calling you to listen. And be silent in moments when God is calling you to speak. Humility gives you the eyes and the ears to see and hear the spirit of God when he's moving and how he's moving. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, according to James 4. He hates haughty or arrogant eyes, according to Proverbs 6. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. Humility is reliance upon the true king. Humility gives you the strength to stand, the compassion to kneel, and the wisdom to know when to do which. We need a little humility. Humility gives you the security in Christ to declare that black lives matter because they do. But don't all lives matter? Wait, 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 wait. Don't all lives matter? Look, guys, the fact that those two phrases are polarized in our society demonstrates the deep insecurities of our nation right now. Bear with me, okay? Because I'm about to rant. How much, what's my, okay. <laughs> There is some hesitation from a lot of people to jump on the Black Lives Matter train. And I get it. I truly do. That train gets hijacked by a sinful agenda. And it honestly doesn't even necessarily believe that all black lives even matter. That's real. Because what about the unborn black life that's still in the womb? 
does that black life matter? Or how about the black police officer? Does their black life matter? Or the black business owner? Does that black life matter? But just because somebody with a political agenda hijacks a phrase doesn't mean the phrase isn't true. Because black lives do matter. So reacting to that and saying all lives matter, though also a true statement only further ignores and devalues that black life who's trying to voice that they matter. And that is not humility. Humility says stop reacting in fear, learn, listen, seek to understand and discern, right? I'm still waiting for the hashtag all black lives matter, right? <laughs> including the unborn baby, including the law enforcement officer, the business owner, the orphan, and yes, including the criminal and drug addict. Because to Jesus, the lost and wayward life matters. They don't forfeit value because of their behavior. That's very different from left or right ideals. Jesus says your life is not valuable according to your behavior. That's actually a works righteousness mentality that is very anti-Christian. Jesus places inherent value upon all life. God values life based on the imago Dei which is the image of God. If you see those signs, that's what it is. It's just Latin for it, image of God. As a Christian, I am at war with those cosmic forces of darkness that devalue human life. Therefore, I will shout in harmony with the author of all creation that black lives do matter, all of them. And you know what? I'm not just talking about the government or the police. I'm talking about black lives. You matter. I be, I'm not talking to some ethereal idea to like be like, oh, look, I'm cool too. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying I, my heart is broken that that's even a thing. And when we tap into the heart of God and, and, and speak this, it's not a degradation of white lives. White lives matter. Blue lives matter. Or any other color. I don't, I don't know. This is an affirmation of inclusion and value to a group that's been historically left out. This is God's heart. Humility turns our eyes off of ourselves and the fears of what, how this might affect me, roots ourselves in the security of our king, and follows him, which leads to the second thing that God is calling his people to do. Pray and seek God's face. I love this. So far, these are both action steps. They don't just happen. They are very, they are to be very intentional, right? right? Without intentionality here, we're going to slip into arrogance and, and a dismissal of God's presence in our lives. So God is calling us to seek him, to pray to him, to seek him for guidance and wisdom and strength. We just sang this, God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you because you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom because you know just what to do. And this is where peace comes from. There's no shame. There's no guilt. There's none of this nonsense about people like lifting themselves up above one another and then saying like, well, now you have to, and now I have to lift myself up above you in order for me to feel like I'm free and liberated and valuable. Now you have to wallow. No, that's nonsense. When we look to the Lord and we praise him and we sing these things, and I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock forever, all my days. I will love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Our God reigns forever, all my days. Our God reigns. That's the security from which we speak affirmation and value over everyone else. I want you to see that it's only the people of God who can even do this. The rest of this world doesn't know how to operate out of that kind of security. They have to operate out of a shame 
pride seesaw. That's not the solution. Never has been, never will be. When we look to him, when we worship him, when we pray to him, when we submit to his glory, his rule and reign, when we seek his face, he transforms our hearts. He changes things in us and around us. And this is only for the people of God. The government can't change hearts. Only the presence of God has the power to do that. And if you are a Christian, then you are called to be a carrier of his presence. One who prays, one who seeks his face. And let me tell you something about the face of God. The face of God, this is one of the most powerful phrases in scripture. The face of God is a phrase that the scriptures use to capture the manifest presence of God Almighty. It's a phrase that captures the characteristics of who he is, that you're gazing upon the very nature of the creator, right? So let's do this. Let's do this for a little bit. You ready? The nature of the creator of the universe is diverse, right? Like in order to join our church, you don't have to wear a blue polka dotted polo, right? Despite what the worship leader and I are doing right now. (laughs) We are a church who loves diversity. You know why? Because God loves it. It's the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity. Three in one. God is by nature three persons in one divine nature. To seek the face of God himself is to seek the very expression of unity in diversity. That gets a little deep, as it should. Oneness, but not sameness. In other words, God is not colorblind. God celebrates diversity. He embraces diversity. All of creation shouts forth his glory in a unified chorus of beautifully diverse culture and heritage. The throne room of heaven is filled with every tribe, tongue, and nation singing in a unified phrase and pra- of praise that holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they're saying it in multiple different languages and, and expressions of culture. And it's gorgeous and it's beautiful and it's godly. And the creator did that. God sees color. Some of you are like, wait a minute. We're not supposed to see color. I thought, I thought we're supposed to be colorblind. No, you're not. I am not a black man. That might surprise some of you. And that's okay. Okay. God sees color and he sees culture and he sees these things and he loves them. That kind of oneness but not sameness celebrates the very nature of who God is. Backgrounds and heritage coming together, unifying, living these things out with purpose and and in his presence. Because racism is a demonic attempt to sterilize that celebration of unity in diversity into a twisted idolatry of self-worship. If you don't dress like me, act like me, look like me, be like me, then you aren't valuable. No, that's self-worship. That's not who he's called us to. It's not who he's called the church to. Praise God. Praise God for the gospel heritage that has come through black culture. Amen? I love it. It is Unique, and it's beautiful, and we need more of it, not less. We need more of it in this church, not less. It doesn't mean that white culture is not good. There's good things there too. This is not a shame game. You see, this is, a, this is an appreciation and a, and a thank God for all these things. Like a seagull doesn't fly by an eagle and be like, you need to get better at catching fish like me. Like, it just doesn't work. That wasn't in my notes. Okay. I saw a seagull. (laughs) Look, this is the point. (laughs) 
a, fr- a friend of mine named Chris Georges, um, he pastors a, a predominantly black church in Chesapeake. Um, and I was listening to a sermon that he preached uh, actually this past week to his congregation. Um, and he was talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. And, and he was preaching on Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit fills the disciples and they begin to speak in foreign tongues. And it says that they begin to miraculously declare the works of God in different languages. And that people from all over the world that are walking by or are nearby, they're suddenly hearing and able to understand them in their own native tongue. It's this powerful, miraculous, and kind of confusing situation. And I realize that there's a lot going on in this passage. But Pastor Chris pointed out that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is that he empowers you to speak the language of people who are different from you. And to speak into their world. The Spirit of God empowers the believer to speak and connect and unify in the gospel of Jesus with people who are totally different ethnically and culturally, a completely different background and heritage. To speak in a way that the other can hear is a spiritual gift. And Chris, Pastor Chris confessed that he was hurting like many of the people in his congregation, maybe like many of you, but he challenged his congregation to humble themselves and let the Spirit bring about revival and healing in the land. And that's exactly what God is calling all of his people who are called by his name to do. If we want to see healing in his land, in our land, humble yourself. Pray and seek his face. And finally, last but not least, turn from your wicked ways. This is the heartbeat of the scriptures. This is the essence of the word repentance. It's the word in Greek, metanoia. It simply means to turn or return to the Lord. So what wicked ways might he be talking about? There's the usual suspects, right? Sexual immorality, greed, selfishness, building your own kingdoms rather than seeking his first in any way. Racism, we just talked about that. That's demonic because it pulls out, it's a sterilizing of God's creation and it's self-worship. I want to focus on this concept of wicked ways, like what it means in scriptures. It's it's like a, a road, right? A way is like a road or, or a pattern of doing things. Like imagine, it, it's sort of like the habitual works of your life that are the fruit of habitual thinking. Who are you following? Who is leading you? If you're not following Jesus, you're going the wrong way. Imagine a field of grass, right? And there's paths on that grass that are well-worn paths through this field. Those are the paths that are there because they're the places that people travel. And spiritually, there are a lot of paths in this world. They're there because that's the ways of this world. It's the pattern or ways of the wicked. Those that have rejected the way or the path of God that is that path of everlasting life. And each path gets presented to us as a righteous path. Every one of them does. And they will twist and pervert the truth. As God's people, we need to continually repent. It's not just a one-time thing. Because this isn't just about salvation. This is about, this is about bringing God's glory, manifesting who he is, and bringing healing to our land. This is not a constant. Like people are like, well, I don't need to repent. I already prayed to receive Christ. You have totally missed the gospel. Because the gospel says that we are constantly being pulled left and right. And there's a spiritual enemy who wants to take us out and wants to defame his name and his glory. And Jesus says, follow me down this path. We've been talking about him being a good shepherd, the path of everlasting life. And so to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness means to follow him, to repent of aligning with worldly ways or worldly paradigms or ways of thinking, that we place Christian values above progressive or conservative values, that the Constitution is not scripture. I don't know if you realize that or not. America is not your church. 
The president is neither your savior nor your pastor. Hear me? I love my country. I believe that it's the greatest country in the world, hands down. But I don't love it more than my king. My king is Jesus. I do pray that God would bless America. But that means that the American church must bless God. You hear me? Doesn't mean that the lost people in America bless God. It means that the Christians bless God. To bless means to adore in many ways. Humble ourselves, pray and seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, and he will hear from heaven and heal our land. May we unite together and cry out as his church, diverse and unified, oneness, not sameness. May we cry out together, our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And where does heaven meet earth? In the church. Now, before I close, I want to invite you guys to join me. We're in a show of unity with churches from all kinds of backgrounds um, throughout the region today in Norfolk. Uh, in front of City Hall at 3 p.m. I think it starts at 3.15. Um, there's going to be basically a prayer walk. That's, uh, it, it's about a show of unity in the face of injustice. Because look, I'm all for social and political reform. I am. But let me tell you something. When local churches from diverse backgrounds come together and unite in prayer in the gospel... The devil gets shook. It's powerful. I want to invite you guys. There's a lot of division and disunity out there right now, but um, I believe that the devil has his back to the wall, and I believe that the church is on the move, and I want to be a part of it. So what the devil means for harm, the Lord uses for good. And I'm going to close with this. Dave already quoted it, but I'm going to do it again. Let the nations rage and the people's plot in vain. God's calling his people to humility, prayer, repentance, and unity. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you that you are our king. We thank you that we can have peace in you no matter what's happening around us. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom because you know just what to do. I pray that we would calm our hearts, calm our minds, whether it's pandemic, whether it's social unrest, whatever's happening around us, we know that we do walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but that you are with us, and therefore we will fear no evil. And God, so we continually repent. We continually confess that we get caught up sometimes in the ways of this world and the different paths. But God, we thank you that you're a good shepherd who comes, even leaves the 99 for the one lost sheep. And so God, I pray that this morning you would gather us together as your flock, empowered with your voice and your presence for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can stand for worship.